wait for a few seconds. The number is rising. Before we start. So we have a stable number. I suppose we can start. Um, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the ninth Power and Energy uh, webinar series. As you may know, but it's always good to remember, um, these webinars intend to promote discussions on some of the major challenges uh, of the energy systems of the future, bringing ideas and solutions that will allow to tackle them. Today, we will have a session on technologies, technologies and intelligence for smart buildings, a very important topic in a moment where decarbonization is on top of the table with all the benefits, but also the challenges that renewable-based generation brings to the overall balance of the electrical system. With me and to foster this discussion, I have David Rua from, from Inestep and Josef Wohlmeister from BSH Home Appliances that I will very br briefly present. So David is a senior researcher in the Center for Power and Energy Systems. Uh, his research interests include modeling and optimization of flexible energy resources, digital platforms and systems for grid management and control and demand response strategies for residential and non-residential buildings. He currently leads the X energy management systems area at the Center for Power and Energy. Joseph, has over 35 years of technical and management experience in mobile and cordless telecommunication, as well as broadband technology. Since 2011, he's working with VSH Home Appliances and is responsible for smart home and smart appliances standardization. From 2016 until November 2020, he was also managing director of the eBus initiative and is a member of the smart home and grid standardization bodies in IC, Senelec, and DKA, as well as in national and international smart home and grid associations and European Commission bodies. So good morning, gentlemen. Nice to have you here. Um, as usual, um, we will have a 20 minute presentation for each one of you that I suggest we do in a row. Um, leaving around 30 minutes uh, in the end for some Q&A and I will ask our attendees that place their questions in the Q&A uh, available here at Zoom for us to discuss, okay? So without any further delays, I would pass the word to David that will bring us uh, the topic of unlocking flexibility in buildings. David, please move on. Okay, thank you very much. So I hope that you can hear me well. Yes, presentation. Okay, should you be in your screen right now? Just tell me if it's full screen. There's usually yes. a little bit. Uh, okay, so thank you very much for, for the introduction and thank you very much for the session today. So um, this session, as I uh, was explaining a while ago, is uh, built upon this theme on the technology intelligence side for smart buildings and finding ways to promote on one side that I'll be introducing here today, the flexibility modeling and usage within the buildings. And uh, to talk about the strategy that we currently are pursuing right now, that hopefully will, will pave the way for the applications in several projects, including a uh, large project we lead, which is Interconnect. But, Today, the idea from my side is to talk about the flexibility and you will see from Joseph's side, this inclusion on the technology front. Uh, I'll try to be to, to do also a linkage between uh, what we are developing here and what are the technologies that support this. So moving ahead with a uh, with talk uh, this morning. So what I want to talk to you about is uh, flexibility and we should start by trying to come up with some of the, of the first definitions of flexibility. So. Um, most of them talk about uh, this ability to change something within a system within specific conditions. Um, others go to, to a, um, a description that talks about the ability to respond in a very structured way, in a timely manner, to variations in supply and demand in the electricity chain. There are some others that talk about um, different ways of coping with the system variability by modifying the production, the consumption uh, within the demand side. 
expected or otherwise. And uh, some others talked about this umbrella uh, that covers the different needs from the grid in aspects that allow to increase the efficiency and the resilience, resilience, resiliency of the system. So this last one, it's interesting because this umbrella is also some is part of the message conveyed here, which is not only to cluster everything under a, a model for flexibility that I'll, that I'll introduce in a while, but also to the fact that by clustering this, we can also create within this umbrella a way of, of not revealing all of the information per se and actually cope with some of the requirements nowadays for users to participate, to respect their private domain and not to disclose more than just the enough information to allow them to participate in the service. So then we go to why do we need flexibility? So again, with the definitions we had earlier on, we need to have mechanisms to deal with the variability of the electric system. So this is something that happens and it's increasing uh, every year with the integration of uh, different renewable systems on the on near the distribution side. And the fact that significant loads uh, are to be uh, readily included very soon, such as the electric vehicle that will introduce more challenges to the grid. So, we do need flexibility to cope with this. And to be honest, this is something that already the power system had with other mechanisms upstream, namely the reserve mechanism. This is also necessary because, uh, as mentioned, if we want to decarbonize, as Luis was mentioning uh, in his introduction, if we want to decarbonize the whole system, we need to find ways to integrate the, the renewable based generation and to make sure that we cope with the variability of those resources. Um, we also need to enhance um, energy efficiency overall. So part of the decarbonization process is to find ways of using energy more efficiently, both locally and globally, and sometimes um, to act, as we could see and we can discuss today, to act efficient globally, we may have some inefficiency locally. Um, I can give you some examples about that, but basically it is to say that you may choose to have a different behavior and to use a bit more energy than you actually need to use if you didn't have any incentive or any interaction with the grid, but ultimately you're considering that everyone benefits from the same efficiency on the system and your inefficiency or small inefficiency locally is actually compensated by a wider efficiency locally. And of course, to consider the civilization and robustness of the electric system, this is also something that we should keep in mind. So in terms of buildings, what is the role that buildings have uh, in this. Already mentioned this integration of renewable generation uh, and the combination of uh, strategies for the grid and also for the end user. So nowadays we're seeing that with integration of renewable generation, especially in buildings, self-consumption mechanisms is something that we need to integrate, but they need to be done in a way that they can easily cope with the grid. Another aspect is the fact that uh, we do need to have uh, buildings with proper incentives to integrate additional intelligence and additional systems, such as asset services and systems that are ultimately managed by, by an entity, which we typically call for the residential sector, the home energy management system, but it's an energy management system overall. And this is also something that in order for us to improve and to invest in the buildings, flexibility should be there to valorize the assets that we have or help valorizing them. Uh, the integration of renewable is then repeated here, but then the final part is the, the support towards uh, another vector that concerns also the buildings, which is to the electric mobility. As we've seen already, uh, this will be a relevant load, but also to the fact that if we want to, to clearly foster electric mobility, we do need to create the conditions to use them uh, in a sustainable way, because it's not likely that we would see reinforcements everywhere in the grid to start with, nor is it likely to see the whole buildings being able to cope with a high density of electric vehicles altogether. So simultaneity of EV charging and other aspects that relate with flexibility in buildings need to be accounted for. So then we have the end users. So we, we already talked about this valorization of existing resources um, and actually put the resources that we already have to an additional use. So we do have resources that are flexible in our household, in the buildings, but we actually just put them into use in a sense that we either uh, have a specific product that we want to derive from them, like taking a, a, a bath, preferably a hot bath, um, but we are not really concerned about uh, how can we use them more than just to take a bath. And there's more to, to some of this load than just the, the final result typically used. We also need to have users uh, to be uh, able to participate in new kind of service. So this kind of flexibility that we want to foster in the demand side clearly needs 
the idea is just to be aligned with this idea of changing the way they use energy towards a purpose. And this purpose has to have uh, underlying in it uh, an incentive to have the participation. So users need to know that they have new services. They also need to, they, they stand to gain, um, let's say, uh, on a financial basis or otherwise from a service that they, they participate in. And not all of the benefits need to be exactly uh, economical benefits. They could be a actually a facilitation of other services and a combination of other services. So um, another point in order to engage in this is, is to ensure that, um, and this falls within the, the first step of the umbrella side of flexibility, which is to exchange information in a way that we don't disclose information that it's not ultimately necessary to produce something. So users uh, need to know that their information and the data that they exchange with a third party, with someone else, they can uh, valorize the, the, their resources and valorize their flexibility in a way that only minimum information is shared. So in, in many of these cases, and this is something that we have been working in, uh, we don't actually need to send information about if you have an electric vehicle in our portfolio or if you have an electric water heater or uh, an HVAC system. We actually just need to, to ensure that we share with someone that wants to valorize our flexibility, our capability, our probability of being flexible towards the consumption. So what are we talking about in terms of the flexibility portfolio? So we're basically talking about two types of loads. Uh, what we call deferable loads and what we call full flexible loads. So the deferable loads are loads that are typically moved in blocks. So uh, they are operated in blocks. It's, they are typical loads that you cannot interrupt. They have a good side to, to this kind of, of approaches uh, when looking at the flexibility, when modeling this into a system that we want to optimize. It's that these loads are typically simple to model um, and they are usually referred to, to models based on constant power with a specific time frame to operation, which fairly depict their operation overall uh, towards flexibility. They're, they do, they are harder to use in, in the optimization process because not being able to interrupt it means that if we're looking to an optimization problem that is usually formulated to solve this, this kind of, of, of challenges, it means that in the space of solutions, you're clipping some viable solutions because you can only move in blocks. Basically, what you have as, as possible cases and possible scenarios are reduced with this block uh, shifting uh, back and forth from these deferable loads. They do have typically something uh, a bit more interesting, which they have a bit less of an impact to comfort and convenience from the user side, as to opposed to some of the flexible ones that I'll mention in a while. We're talking about typically washing machines, dishwashers, uh, clothes dryers, and so forth. So we're talking about loads that typically you cannot interrupt, and there's no specific interest in interrupting them because they're not viable. We're not including here for this kind of flexibility other types of loads such as uh, refrigerators because they are even uh, trickier to move in, although they, they may fall on the, on the range of flexible loads, but we're just considering those that may have a minimum impact into the day-to-day -to -day operations within the, the household. So flexible loads are a bit different. So it's in fact the, the a load that can be triggered multiple times. So you can interrupt them, you can schedule them later on. They are more complex to model because they need to cope with several restrictions. One of them is the operation of, of the device itself, but also to include other restrictions related with comfort and convenience from the end users. So uh, these the kind of loads are loads that cannot be triggered uh, well uh, at uh, um, any time. They need to be triggered at specific times that to ensure that the comfort is not compromised. They are uh, easier to use in the acquisition formulation because they are more flexible. They do have an higher impact on comfort and convenience, and this is one of the reasons why we should look at these kind of loads a, a bit more carefully when modeling them. Examples that you can find on some of these flexible loads are uh, HVC systems, electric water heaters, electric vehicles. Everything that relates with the thermal load typically is regarded as a flexible load. Everything regarded with uh, batteries, even if they are within uh, electric vehicles, also regarded as flexible loads. So this is the kind of, of modeling that we have. So. Typically also for the, the optimization of the portfolio, there are different criteria that we can follow, price base, CO2 base, or any, or any other um, incentive based uh, criteria. We can actually cluster and couple some of these criteria to produce optimal uh, operation, as you will see in a while, for the different assets. And we have typically also constraints that we need to, to uphold. These are some of the constraints that we can find in these kind of problems, which basically dive in, we need to consider the devices and systems characteristics, the user's preferences and um, some of, uh, of what could be the, the limitations that can they can encounter from the grid side. Uh, 
specifically the, some sort of power limitations that need to be to be considered here. And this is valid. Um, let's be clear for all of the of the devices that I've mentioned. Well, so for the forable and fully flexible loads, we need to consider all of these constraints. The part of preferences they can they can actually go to to the side of um, the configurations of the appliances themselves and the fact that the inducers may not have. Um, let's say may not be able or may not want a specific loader of a specific system to be triggered at a specific time. Say for it is for noise uh, or for not disturbing any of the environment that the user also wants to, to make sure that that load cannot be triggered at specific times. All of this uh, and much more needs to be considered when we're doing the optimization of, the, of, of this kind of system. So what kind of, of opportunities are we unlocking here? So. Again, we're announcing the role of participants and the retailers. Uh, we're differentiating here. And you will see that right now there's a trend so far then, and there's something different that we can do with flexibility. More on that in a few minutes. But basically, we're enabling a way to remunerate flexible assets that we have within the buildings and allow two types of stakeholders to benefit from this, or two or three types, the end user itself and the service provider, being either the service provider uh, a retailer, an aggregator, or even the DSO itself, directly or indirectly, they are both set to benefit from all of this enhancement on flexibility. Different business models can be also reach out here. And some of the business models are directly related with the energy optimization, but not only. And just to give you an idea, if we have uh, this flexibility measure within buildings, we have an entity responsible that I mentioned a while ago, which is the energy manager that it's looking for this portfolio to optimize, but it's probably retrieving more information that could use in other kind of search. And we can even talk about data related search. So again, finding ways of um, exploiting this flexibility and one of them could be flexibility as a service. And you can actually cluster ways and it's difficult to see this in other applications where, for instance, you're not just using your device and using flexibility, it may come to a point where even a retailer can um, rent you or provide you with one uh, appliance and with it, uh, a flexible plan has to be engaged. But then we can aggregate at different types of systems and uh, different types of natures into, into what would be the participation to this optimization. Another point that's being um, created and unlocked with this, uh, the, this part of flexibility is the support to, to energy communities. And, and this is an interesting part that I'll approach in a while, which has to do how to create a community and how to drive a benefit for a community-based system uh, we're aligned with the flexibility. And this has to do uh, with the typical approach that has been done so far, that I'll mention in the next slide, which is a top-down approach and a bit of a, what could be a bottom-up approach that we are also exploring here with uh, a few different concepts. So what is exactly the top-down approach? I won't, I won't go too much time into this, but just to say that there's typically incentive already, already published, provided, consulted by uh, the manager within the household based either in a price curve or incentive curve that you have access to it to have a sort of a behavior. So if you have a price curve, if you have your loads part of your baseline within your household, it's difficult for you to optimize and to shift the loads, as you can see here, shifting the loads to, to where the price is low and to derive a financial benefit, which is to reduce the overall cost with the operation. So this is something that we, we are able to do already. This is something that we have developed already in previous projects with the home energy management system, being able to fetch information automatically from, from a, a service provider that publishes dynamic tariffs such as this one, and basically react and make the appliances react within the, the configurations, the characteristics, and the, 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 the preference from the end users towards, for instance, the price reduction. So within the same top-down approach, uh, other uh, ideas and other criteria could be used and have been used, which is, for instance, the use of, of um, local energy production, where we have an energy production curve as a PV system that can exist locally, and we may choose or have the system uh, clustering the loads or setting up loads preferably to periods in which uh, we have uh, local generation production, typically PV systems that we have here. So we have differentiated loads uh, of different nature. So we have, again, here, the typical loads that I was just mentioning a while ago. Uh, the block loads, shift loads, deferral loads, and the, the flexible loads, typically thermal loads or, or electric vehicles. This is just an example to, to present what is a top-down approach. What is the, the bottom-up approach? It's actually to look this in a different angle. To look for flexibility first, try to estimate that, and try to 
provides that flexibility to someone that could be using it. So we need to find out the model that reflects this ability to change the energy the, the energy use profile within the with the household that is capable of um, representing what could be a charging or a discharging process with the grid. Um, and this falls within this idea of creating a representation as a battery for a household or for a set of systems. More on that later on, it has to do with the formulation. But basically, if you create the model based on, on the battery for um, the household, we are hiding a lot of the information uh, or pseudo hiding a, a lot of the information within this, this representation of a battery. So, if we have a battery representing this this uh, this building, we can either charge or discharge the battery. And charging the battery means increasing the net load and actually absorbing more power to the grid than the baseline had foreseen. Discharging the battery means removing the load or even injecting into the grid if we have elements to do so. In most cases, the control injection into the grid of uh, storage elements within a residential building it's not only uncommon as it is still not exactly viable or still there's not a business plan to that. But if we have other loads, if we have flexible loads, such as uh, thermal loads and so forth, we can find ways of either anticipating or postponing the use of that load and to create this, the, this idea of discharge, which is within the baseline to avoid loads that were there or were likely to be there within the typical baseline. We do need to provide this control flexibility, this, this control schema for flexible access to produce the required plan. And just to, to, to emphasize here, to produce this required plan has to, to, find, well, to find ways to deal with the, the variability on the, on the demand side. And the fact that even if the user has everything modeled within, within a flexibility plan to provide to the grid, there are still changes that are may not be fully accounted for. So simultaneously, we may have a load relief or load, load reduction. And by simultaneity, we have a, an unexpected load being brought in and then flexibility is, is completely um, nullified. So the idea of this model is again, to, to hide the characteristics of the control portfolio and just check how we can do this, this, um, this part of flexibility that can later on be stacked all together with different elements. This is the formulation, which are a uh, part of the formulation, which I, I won't go into details here. So this is part of the work being done by several of my colleagues too in different projects. So in the in the in the first slide, I had a few names there, but they are the team is way larger than that. But this is just to tell that we have to consider, of course, power, energy, and the representation of state of charge. The only thing just to mention here is that if we're talking about the battery, the battery can either have uh, two behaviors. The battery is either charging or it's either discharging at, the, at different times. So this is a multi-temporal formulation between what is uh, the status of one battery to another. And what you can see here on T is a different time frame that we consider for this controllability. Um, typically, for the dynamic tariff schemes that we have already seen the most advanced in Europe, we're looking for intervals in 50 minutes. So each of these elements here uh, in T covers 96 periods of the next day. Um, one important aspect is, is this index N, which refers to the battery itself. So we can have one single battery to represent the whole building, or we can have batteries representing specific types of load that we have in a household. And they, th these could be, for instance, the, the clustering of thermal loads, uh, the use of a separate uh, model for electric vehicle. This has to do with the ability for the, the home energy management system to better cope with the specific characteristics of each of these type of, of flexible assets, but ultimately to not disclose this uh, upstream. So even if, if this is clustered under several batteries within a household, it's not share this information upstream to what could be uh, the portfolio that is being triggered. Basically, what we are proposing here is a set of representation as a battery. So as a battery, this is the kind of representation for, instance, for electric water heater that it's that is configured to be operating around 50 degrees that has a state of charge of zero. This means that with 50 degrees, we're looking for something that doesn't compromise the, the overall comfort experience from the end user. But this is where we can, for instance, think about uh, configuring a set point to the, to the electric water heater for 60 degrees and call this a 50% of state of, state of charge towards a battery representation. This means if we're ranging between 50 to 70 degrees, that 60 represents halfway with the state of charge of a battery that gives us a possibility to, to either work as a load that it's being uh, deferred to a later stage 
or as an additional load that we can increase because we still have 50% to charge. And we may end up with a, a load increase in charging the battery to reach out 100%, which is to continue to charge the battery. So this load increase, load decrease means that we are either charging the battery or discharging the battery. In, in, the length, in, in, uh, in plain terms, for you to understand what are the implications. So let's consider this place that over let's water here, where we have the ability to state with our current trend that we have um, the, the possibility to, to prevent these activations at the end of the day from taking place. And we can consider the, those in the, in the modeling and the optimization process, and we can actually run an optimized consumption and remove those two activations to a part of the day that has no impact or no perceivable impact. This has to do with the ability to change to a point that doesn't compromise the late operation, but also to show two things. If you remember correctly, two of the activations did disappear. And this is just an illustration because several scenarios could be created with, the, with the, the, the simulations. But to represent one realistic scenario, which is we removed two consumption points, but we created another one which was not foreseen. But if our commitment was to provide flexibility for this, this two, the later two that we had previously here, we remove them to, to an area that allows us to increase the temperature of the, the appliance and basically percent from those activations later on. But still, since we have some preferences from the end users, one point needs to, to consider is the, the decrease of temperature in the, in, the, in the system. One thing that I haven't mentioned is this, this uh, decrease in temperature more pronounced with steeper uh, slopes are due to bathing process. So if you have a bathing process around in the morning and a bidding process in, in the end of the day. This is something that we need to, to ensure that still happens. So this means that an unforeseen activation may occur earlier on. But since we were proposing flexibility for a different hour, we can still commit to not uh, having that load there at that specific hour. This does not mean, of course, that other loads cannot be there. And that's part of the challenge still to be covered here. And this is why different strategies can be followed even within the optimization. So we have an optimization done at the level of the household that responds and still has day-to-day -day operation, then we have uh, an optimization done at the aggregator, at the representative of, of this flexible participant that needs to cope with this. If, this, the, if, the, uh, if the, the aggregator knows exactly what's the participation and what's the problem of the portfolio, it can send the proper incentives downstream so that the, homes, the, the home energy management system can cope with these different strengths. One of the things to consider is when you're looking for flexibility, how should we pre-configure our assets to better respond to this flexibility? This is a problem typically um, in a bottom-up approach, uh, chicken and the egg. So who defines incentive, who communicates the flexibility? Because if we communicate an incentive, we may influence the flexibility. If we communicate the flexibility beforehand, we may influence the way the incentives can be provided to the end user. So, this bottom-up approach that we're presenting here from a, um, a virtual battery allows us to consider this first glimpse of what could be my willingness to participate in the flexibility scheme. And if I want to be, in the case of overthermal load, a conservative, I can even have the, the, the associated virtual battery at 50%, giving me the same probability of increasing the load of not using the load at a specific time. If I want to be uh, more prone towards load increase, I probably reduce the temperature. So I, I discharge a battery before to be able to compensate and then to increase load at a specific time. And the same, it can happen in the different directions. So if I need to remove the load at very specific times, if I'm requested to do that very often, I might as well in the periods where I don't have that restriction to actually charge the battery as, as high as possible to allow us to go through to these periods to actually have it to activate them. So very quickly, just to, to cover this bridge because I've already exceeded my time. Uh, we're creating all of this within the, the, the framework of, of interconnected project for the interoperability, where we're creating different systems here with different representations. Some of them, the devices that that uh, Joseph will talk in a while, but just to tell you that in this creation, we need to look for the interoperability service. So this interoperability service means in creating the definition of the service itself in an hyperplane of interoperability. So what is, where are the variables, where are the conditions for this, this, this service to be there? The, to facilitate this machine-driven data exchange to allow different uh, uh, machines, either in the building, either in the aggregator or the service provider to take care 
of this in a comprehensive way that understands what are the needs from site to site without having to have human intervention. And this is done, and it's been done in the internet project using Saraf as the base ontology to set up interoperability. So this is where we integrate this interoperability in the energy management system that we're, we're using in the demonstration in the pilot. And this is how we are doing this. So we are creating representations and parameters for this flexibility, where we've defined uh, a clear um, structure for flexibility with timestamps, with the upward and downward flexibility, the units that we're using, the prices that can be attributed to this flexibility, uh, and then specific characteristics with this, which is the units and some of, of the ideas towards the, 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 end, the end use of energy. This is done uh, using SAREF with a representation that it's easily perceived by machines, namely with the part uh, displayed in SAREF that recurs to RDF and other similar structures that we as a full talk a bit more later on that creates this interoperability to make this, this work. For this to work, for this interoperability, for this flexibility to be used by the end consumer, we need to have this service that is easily perceived by several entities and allow us to exchange all of this information in a standardized way. So what are the limitations and the main challenges just to close my presentation? One of them talking about a while ago is how to valorize the flexibility. How do we create incentives? Do we start with the top down? Probably not. The bottom up can create already some ground to create the proper incentives. This is particularly interesting on the remuneration schemes and particularly important for the cases of communities where if you're creating a community that has no idea of the value of flexibility, we may start by trying to first estimate what's the flexibility overall and then to derive benefits. Again, to deal with the variability of the demand side, there's still this point of even if we have flexibility, even if you model it, uh, either in a probabilistic model or something more complex, the, the, the approach here has to be uh, to consider always variability from the demand side. The end user may be prone to participate with some loads on flexibility, but ultimately it, it depends on the variability that it has on its day to day use it to be compensated. So it's up for other entities to, to cope with this if they have information about the, the potential for more than one participant to take, to take part on this. And finally, just to close, to include the how do we include the flex the, the characteristics of these resources? Um, we we are activating, we are using these resources all together. And the question comes: Can we actually cope with all of them with with a single representation? And being the single representation, less information being shared upstream, but also less capability of of having a clear idea of how far can the control be? And this can come up with the questions such as. For instance, in the in the virtual battery, the the power curve, so the the slope on the power that we can take per time unit, which means the the amount of energy that we can store or we can uh, release in the battery per uh, per time period. And this includes having this slope representing the average of different flexible resources. So if we are doing this uh, overall for the the building, or if we are doing this. For specific types of loads, it's something still upon discussion. Point being is again, if we're dealing with this uncertainty, it means that we need also to 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 deal with the fact that different resources have different impacts. So this is all also one of the points that we're addressing here. So with this, I'll finalize my my introduction here just to show what is the 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 approach from our side towards flexibility. I took a bit more time, but we can leave the questions to a second stage. So I don't know. Wish and if we should move to Josef right now, or if we have already some questions, I'm not seeing the, the chat. No, I, I think we should. I think we should leave the questions uh, to the end. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, we will move to to Josef's presentation uh, under the title "Climate Change: Ways to Interoperable Energy Management." Josef, go ahead, please. Yeah, thanks a lot. Do you see my screen now? Yes, it's not in full. Yeah, now it's in full screen. So now it's in full. Great. Okay, so um, great presentation, uh, David. You already explained uh, what I want to use here. And, uh, I'm not talking about the formulas regarding flexibility. Uh, my um, talk here is about how to exchange information in an interoperable way so that we can manage uh, energy management. Motivation. Just to give you an idea about what we are doing in, in, in for example, in Germany, uh, in Hamburg, Norderstedt, they have lots of windmills. They want to use the wind energy as um, unfortunate as possible 
And what we see here is different voice of customers we need to take care about. For example, here the end customer who wants to use green energy, who wants to offer flexibility. Um, for example, with deferrable loads, uh, we have the ESPs, energy service provider, wants to have a contract with me, wants to offer me energy, and the DSO who needs to transport the energy to my home at a certain time. So in uh, that case, what we need to take care about is all the different stakeholders and their, um, uh, their, their duties and their expectations in mind. How did we do that in our interconnect project? We used the de design thinking methodology. I do not want to dig into the details of this methodology, but this helps us to understand the different needs, the problems, the uh, to uh, um, elaborate uh, ideas um, uh, for uh, specific solutions. And last but not least, we need to implement and test it, how we do it in, in, uh, and as we do it in, in our interconnect project. Just to give you a brief overview, what we did is, for example, the problem framing is describing the problem itself, the ECOMAP system where it belongs to the country specific requirements um, in the country analysis. Secondly, what we did is we defined uh, solution ideas. We detail them, uh, we uh, put them in service concepts. Um, and last but not least, based on that, we defined Epix user stories, high level use case to make this clear, crisp and clear. From the specific perspective, uh, we define the roles, personas, user stories, and so forth to make it clear and visible what is the expectation of each and everybody in this context. As a result, what we got is um, four cluster. The first is flexibility, as already uh, mentioned by David in detail. Uh, the second one is the grid, stabiliza uh, grid stabilization. It's also part of flexibility. Um, um, the third one is you need to monitor it if you want to react upon. And the uh, fourth uh, cluster is the comfort and convenience because I think no user will uh, use it if it is not uh, comfortable at all. Now I'm going to the process itself and to describe a little bit what, what uh, are the main uh, intentions or expectations. What you see here is very easy. Uh, we have three roles in our game here. The energy service uh, supplier wants to offer wind energy based on flexible tariffs. The second one is the DSO who needs to transport it to my home. And the third one, I, as a consumer, as a user, want to uh, consume energy based on tariffs and available uh, capacity because uh, the wind energy is volatile. And another circumstances, the easiest way is how you could, could do is, is you um, do it manually, you get the prices, you get the uh, information, hey, it can be delivered. For example, you buy 100 books by Amazon, and you ask your, your transporter, your, your postman, hey, can you deliver it? And then you start it and do it yeah, manually. But I think this is not what we expect um, because if you wanna manage our complete house, it's a little bit more complicated. We need to take care about all the different um, yeah, figures we have at a certain time. Uh, and that's the reason why we are talking about an energy management system or home energy management system. And that relates also to two different kinds of communication. The first one is the manual communication. We as a user, we program our devices. And the second one, this is the machine to machine interaction. And that is of essence because machines need to understand each other in a clear way. A scenario one is, for example, if my energy service provider wants me to uh, wants to offer me tariffs, he needs to have a clue about what I'm consuming, what I'm expecting, and that also leads to a situation that I need to um, at least to uh, provide my demand for the next time as 
as good as it is possible. The second one is if I expect the delivery of a huge amount of energy, we need to ask if this is um, capable to be transported by the DSO. And that leads also to a scenario that the uh, energy service provider and the DSO need to talk about the expectations. And the third one, um, in any uh, circumstances, it can be that there is a different situation uh, at a specific time. And then my energy management needs to know about limitation of the power consumption if there's a restriction in the grid. Um, now coming back to white goods, I'm working with BSH home appliances and that is for example, the white goods, David uh, used already this uh, example a couple of minutes ago. How does it work now? For example, my energy management system gets the price offer from the ESP, uh, gets the information, hey, I can deliver what you want. And now I, as a user, have programmed my washing machine in a very easy and convenient way. Hey, be ready at six o'clock or eight o'clock in the evening when I'm coming home. The rest now will be exchanged between the energy manager and my uh, white goods device, my home appliance. And that means, for example, that the home appliance informs the energy manager about this is my demand, this is my power curve. I need to consume if I wanna wash the laundry and I need this until eight o'clock in the evening. And the energy manager now calculates based on, on, on the examples um, here, David has given already, calculates when is the best time to start my washing machine and can update my start time as long as I, not, uh, I did not start. Or if I, as a washing machine, allow to be interruptible, then I can also be interrupted or paused. But under normal circumstances, this is not the right uh, solution for a washing machine. Here you see, for example, once again, the user interaction and the machine to machine interaction. I do not want to go into the details in this sequence diagram. You can read it uh, later on if you want to um, get the presentation afterwards. But what I want to focus on a little bit is on the scenarios of the use case. Yeah, On the left side, and this is how we describe it step by step though, so that it can become interoperable. The first one is the smart appliance announces the power plant or the demand of energy consumption to the energy manager or on the one, uh, other side, the energy manager at any time can request the plan, for example, if it needs to, be, to get an update or if it has lost information and then the smart appliance sends the plan again to the EMS. At a certain time, whenever it may, may uh, make sense, the EMS can now shift my preferred power sequence or can select an alternative power sequence if I offered two or more power sequences in parallel, for example, for an eco mode, be uh, long and uh, with a reduced power consumption, be fast uh, with a high power consumption at a certain time and so forth. So that means both can be done by the EMS. It can shift my stardom. It can select an alternative power sequence and can also shift the stardom accordingly. Last but not least on the right side, you see here, if I as a manufacturer have allowed to be uh, to pause the cycle during the runtime, then my, my energy manager can also pause or stop it and can uh, resume it later on and I proceed my uh, laundry cycle. So these are the use cases or the cycles, the scenarios of the use case. An energy management um, or an energy manager can use to um, optimize energy consumption in the home environment. Now, what we need to do is if we want to exchange this information between the uh, washing machine and the energy manager, we need to define what is a power sequence? How does a power sequence look like? Um, 
And here you see, for example, the original power sequence provided by the washing machine, uh, slot one for the pre-washing with 300 watts, slot two for the uh, heating phase with two kilowatts, slot three with the uh, washing phase with uh, 200 watts, however you mod modulate or however you um, create the power sequence is up to the manufacturer to cope the behavior of the washing machine. This will be sent to the EMS. And as you have seen it, the EMS now can shift it according to the needs of the EMS itself or the complete behavior of the um, system of the home environment. Few constraints. You might, uh, you, as a user, you might at an earlier start time, for example, you want to be, uh, uh, you uh, do not want to uh, be disturbed during lunchtime, uh, during your short nap, or latest end time is, hey, this needs to be ready at eight o'clock when I'm coming home. And the rest is up to the energy manager. Mapping to the architecture. We have different constellations. We started, for example, with VSH and Neil. We started in 2016 putting and implementing this as a communication module inside our device, communicating with the local management or local manager inside the premises. On the other side, now the time has come uh, popping up that everything is placed in the cloud. So that means what we do we have is every manufacturer has a cloud and has exposed the capabilities in the cloud so that the energy manager, wherever it is located, can use and manage accordingly. These are different passes we need to take into account. But on the other hand is the high level use case. And this is based on the smart grid architecture model. Uh, here you see the business use cases, the high level use case, these remain the same you wanna get the same result. The primary use case or the technical use cases and the use case functions for the communication between the devices are completely the same. It is not related to any specific transport. On the third level, the information level, we already, uh, David already talked about the ontology, Sarah Forena ontology and resources uh, we are talking here about spine resources as we as uh, white goods manufacturer uh, are using the spine resources as one of the possibilities. The transport inside the premises could be, for example, the spine protocol, the ship um, transport, the web, web sockets, TLS. In the cloud, you can use, for example, HTTP, REST API, Open API, OS2, all the technologies you might use in the cloud. Uh, or in the internet world. So in that case, uh, we clearly need to distinguish the, uh, the, the, um, uh, the levels of information and the levels of, uh, um, yeah, the typology of, of sorry, no, no, I didn't get it, yeah. Mapping onto interconnect. Here you see again what we do as manufacturer. For example, meal or home uh, um, meal at home uh, or home connect for BSH. We expose our spine uh, information, our plan with power sequence in our API in our home connect cloud, so that everybody body can use it. On the other hand. David already talked about that in our interconnect, we use the SAR sparkle and graph pattern solution. So that means what we need to do is we need to adopt that on, we need to use that. Otherwise we are not interoperable and we cannot exchange information to our energy manager, of course, yeah? So that means what we need to do is, and what we do right now also in interconnect is that we add a service specific adapter mapping our spine IoT and our SARF um, graph pattern solution so that we can communicate completely um, and complete the chain. The intention or the, the main issue is that, uh, or not the main issue, the main uh, duties are that 
if we use spine, we need to make it compatible with the SARF ontology. And that is something we already started in 2013 and 2014 together with the European Commission and others. We made this spine classes, the spine information already completely um, compatible and compliant to the SARF ontology so that you will see it later on, we can map it easily uh, and directly one-to-one. -one. Now coming back to using the different technologies, SARF and SPINE, um, and you, you see here once again, the power sequence, what we need to express in the different types of information uh, mapping. Here you see the power sequence in spine. It is described as a kind of classes, for example, the power sequence itself with the sequence ID, with the value source, is, is it measured, calculated, empirical. The schedule, as already mentioned, it's the start time and the end time. Constraints, early start time, latest end time, the state, it's the is it running is it paused is it scheduled is it pending is it inactive is it invalid sorry there are mistakes here in the active slot number this is a sequence remote controllable or is it only an information last but not least the number of slots each slot is described with a slot number with a default duration with the slot number with a uh, value type is it a power min expected or max as you see it here? Yeah. Or, um, and the value itself. Yeah. So that means this explains precisely how the power curve looks like and what is expected. Now, and this is how we do it. And you, you saw it already in, in, in the uh, presentation of David, how we do it. This is uh, our, um, YAML file if we express our sequence with three slots. Now coming to serve to the ontology itself. First of all, what we need to do is we need to explain how the power sequence looks like. And the ontology describes it in a way that it um, describes the information itself and the behavior behind. So that means, for example, in this case, the power sequence contains a Sarah Forena described sequence ID with a variable sequence ID. It has a Sarah described time, start time, end time, earliest uh, um, start time, early, latest um, end time. It has a state defined in Sarah with a state with the information or with the content running, paused, and so forth. It has a value source, one of measured values, calculated empirical value. And it consists of slots, yeah? And each slot belongs to the power sequence. This is described in the ontology and you know exactly and precisely, hey, I need one sequence ID, I have one start time, I have one end time, I have a number of slots and slots, and this is described here. The power sequence contains uh, slots, the slot one, for example, in this uh, um, uh, scenario and this example, is, has a sequence ID one, uh, default duration one, and so forth. So power min one, expected value, um, power expected value one, power max one, which is measured um, according to SARF, measured in a measurement min expected, and so forth. And here you see latest, uh, the value min, the expected value, and the power max value. So this is the description of each slot. Um, and that is what we do in SARF. Now, coming back to the next level, we need to define it as already mentioned by uh, David. We have a power sequence, which is an RDF type, SARF or power sequence. And this is 
according to the Etsy standard Sara Freina. Each power sequence has a sequence ID, as already mentioned. This value could be, for example, one unsigned integer. And this is also belongs to a Sara Freina sequence ID with a variable sequence ID, which needs to be filled out during runtime. It has a value source, it has a start time and so forth. This is how we create now the ontology itself and then apply with the graph pattern. Yeah, so that means the graph pattern explain at, at, at a certain time the detailed values of, a, of an ontology, of the ontology lying behind. This is how it looks like if we use the triples, as already mentioned. We have here the power sequence. This is defined as an RDF uh, type and has the um, URI uh, um, power sequence based on Sarah Forena. The power sequence contains the sequence ID explained in Sarah Forena sequence ID. So that means if you use the sequence ID based on Sarah Forena sequence ID, you already know in the ontology the um, explanation of this specific type of information. You see that it uh, belongs to an uh, unsigned integer. You see that it belongs to a Boolean. You see that it belongs to a string and so forth. So this is the um, very good and positive uh, uh, way of describing everything. If you know this ontology and the structure of the ontology behind, you can use it and you only can exchange the sequence ID as a pattern, nothing more. In this context, and this is something what we need to work on in this interconnect project and maybe also later on is, if you have nested solutions, you already saw that here in this picture, a power sequence may contain a number of slots and you don't know the exact number of slots before because you don't know uh, what the uh, manufacturer has implemented, how it has realized the power sequence. This is now a pity that you need to define each slot here step by step. And that leads, for example, for a description of the slot one of three, as we have mentioned before, here in this complete chain of um, information we need to exchange, this is slot two of three, and this is slot three of three. My last point is, and, and this is something what we need to, to, to focus on in, in our interconnect project and also in further studies is, typically the intention of the graph pattern is, I only need to exchange these variables because the rest is already well known. If I have a flat and a fixed structure, means I know the number of slots, each um, structure is defined, then I only need to convey the uh, variables with the, ex, uh, with the explanations or with the dates at a certain time. What we need to focus on is what is, uh, uh, how do we manage it if this structure is not known? For the time being is what we do is we send the complete sequence of um, triples to an intermediate management system which ex, uh, which yeah defines in runtime the structure of the um, of, of this power sequence to make it available to the other peer I'm, I'm sorry it, it's it's not very easy to understand maybe that I'm a little bit too complicated now but but hopefully you get my point. For the time being, what we do is here, and this is now how we ensure interoperability. What we do is we map our YAML file with the same information, the sequence ID, here the active slot number, the sequence is controllable, the start time, the end time. These are the same information because we are completely compliant. 
now we, we send the complete package of information to the peer. In the future, what we expect is that this whole bunch of information is only containing sequence ID number, state scheduled, active slot number, number, and so forth. So that means very easy, as easy as we have it here. And then for me, it's clear that we com can complete the complete chain of mapping our spine, our IoT into a ontology based on SARF, and we are completely interoperable. Last but not least, this now leads to a picture that we send our information via the service-specific adapter to the exchange platform to our EMS. And on the EMS side, there can be another technology or they can directly use SARF. How they, uh, however they want to do that. So this is my last slide. Um, what I would like to highlight is that this gives the opportunity that we can be interoperable in each and every way if we um, comply to an ontology, if we make this ontology clear, if we um, expose this ontology to the peer on the other side. And this makes me confident that we are really interoperable also in the future. Hopefully it was not too um, yeah, complex right now. And I'm <laughs> sorry, I'm, I'm happy to uh, uh, answer all the questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Josef. No, it was not too complex. These sessions are quite technical, and I think you brought us um, a very comprehensive view of how we can implement this uh, flexibility. It's not an easy task, um, but I think you managed to, 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 to explain to all of us. Thank you very much. Um, we have we have one, one question that David uh, already answered uh, during this session. But we now have another one uh, from Emily that asks us, uh, what is the most appropriate optimization model of thermal loads? I don't know, David, if you want to, to tackle this one. Yeah, I think there's two things. One thing is that the modeling itself. So typically what we use for the modeling as for thermal loads is RC modules, so uh, which are compounded according to the level of detail we want to have from the thermal load. So if you have more elements from RC has to do with level of detail we have on, on that model. And ultimately the complexity it takes then afterwards to use an optimization tool to consider that. So for, for those, we use RC models. For the other appliance shift tool, we use constant power for time. So um, that's the, the, the differentiation factor there. What we can do is to use some adjustments afterwards. We already did that with some calibration for, for the even the RC models based on actual experimentation. So Power to temperature curve, it's something that we can correct uh, if we have data to it. So for this, what uh, Josef was mentioning a while with SARF, so part of, of this means that we find ways and structure ways to know exactly what is the information that the appliance is um, exposed externally. And if we have part of that information, we can implement different operation strategy. I was mentioning that a while ago and to complement on that, even for instance, for electric water heater, we could have two approaches there. One of them is um, to consider that we are able to send set points to the thermal load. And uh, this can be done with a smart appliance schema. Or if we have, uh, or if we're facing a bit more of a retrofitted electric water heater or something that it's not smart at all, we can use direct set points uh, on and off and estimate the temperature. And this is done, of course, with a um, the behavior of the appliance based on this RC model and this part temperature curve. Thank you, David. Um, well, from our audience uh, at the moment, we have no, no further questions. Either they are shy or we have this session too early. Let's hope they can post additional ones. Um, just, I, I, have, I, have, I have some questions. Um, this is a very, um, let's say, critical topic uh, when we talk about the integration of, of renewables. But 
there are some technical aspects um, that are quite challenging, and, and I would like to go back, David, to, 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 the, to the point where we were talking about the exchange of information as a support to, to, to this flexibility. Uh, we know that typically, and this is something that uh, demand response and flexibility activation is something that has been done over the years with other uh, alternatives, uh, from particularly from the SOs to solve particular uh, um, needs on, on the system. Um, but when we talk about data, um, you did mention that this, this information exchange. Isn't this a condition to have this service running locally, making public only uh, the bandwidth of flexibility that each uh, consumer can provide? Yes, in fact, I believe so. This is this is my opinion, but I believe it's shared within our research group that we actually don't need to find ways of having, let's say, a fully centralized operation system. That was even the fact that when we were discussing a few years ago about the concepts of microgrids and multi-microgrids, we came up with strategies for uh, distributed control and distributed optimization. Because back then, even back then, having a system that it's fully operated by a DSO or utility, it wouldn't make sense. And at that time, the limitation had to do with the communication uh, systems that were fairly uh, limited to exchange a large amount of information just to have an optimization done at the centralized node that would cope with the whole system, like a, a whole seeing eye that would send discriminated actions to each of the assets. We instead implemented this multi-level optimization. Um, here, I think it's pretty much the same scenario where we could have for instance, an aggregator that would know everything with all the resources within each of the of their own customers. But in fact, they, they don't only know, don't need that, uh, and they this would make the whole process very complex when you need to change from one aggregator to another. So if the process is based on something like a battery and it's fully and it's not completely decoupled, but in, in the large majority it is. We have a battery that represents a, a building or a set of loads that we don't know what it is. Then it's up for someone else to take care of that specific uh, asset with the characters that are passed on to them and decide on how to, to, to use that asset jointly with the user. So I believe this, this serves two purposes. Not only it, it, it avoids a lot of the information set back and forth to aggregate this in a single entity, but also promotes the fact that if it's distributed, then you have the elements uh, within the, the, the installation done in the household with the home and inventory system that Joseph also mentioned, and the optimization system done at the retailer or aggregator, doing their own work without actually having to know everything. This facilitates the whole process for sure, because then it decouples the approach and ensures that one thing is the operation inside the house, another thing is the operation with the clustering of, of, of these elements at the level of an aggregator. Moreover, there's the fact that um, with the variability on the consumption side, some of this principle may, may be fully defeated. So you have an idea of optimizing a specific load, but then with simultaneity, you have another load. And for that specific house, you're uh, compromising the, the, the schedule towards flexibility. Now, if you have a, um, a pool of flexible resources, then you can implement smarter strategies that look for that flexibility upwards and downwards and configure them according to the, the approach. I will go back to that issue on, on the individual optimization of the load. But first, I would like to, to, to ask Joseph, there is, when we were discussing microgrids, we used to have something that was interesting, that the load was actually bigger uh, because things were not that efficient. And, and it's, it's something that increases complexity because and in a moment where we want to increase awareness on the one hand and so people are tending to change technology and technology goes uh, more and more efficient um, the, the expectation of us to have a relevant controllable load inside the household is something that is becoming more difficult because from from the appliances to lightning and so on uh, we, we are reducing the, this bandwidth in which we can control without losing comfort but from your presentation, I think that it became clear that we should leave um, 
this uh, operation to manufacturers because when you were presenting the, the the washing cycle of the machine the different points and so on this this in fact is something that it, it's the only way we can uh, actually have something to control because those are processes that naturally someone cannot control we can connect or disconnect the machine but how do you see the, the role of these uh, manufacturers in, in in this process Josef? I think for me it's of, of, of essence that first of all each device, each component in the complete um, environment has an own duty. So that means the washing machine, as already mentioned, also the, the heat pump, the car, the uh, uh, charging stations, of course, they have a specific duty. They need to de define their own requirements. On the, uh, let me give you an example. Um, for example, if a car wants to charge, today it uses tariff information. It gets the information because in the public it already is available. The user can, um, can, can choose their own preferences and can make a decision based on that. This is for, first of all, the decision of the user. Then the car can inform and can ask how that copes with the requirements of the EMS the energy manager. The energy manager now can provide the info, uh, tariff information. If I'm uh, charging at home or in a home environment, it can um, provide a power curve or uh, um, yeah, power limitation curve. So in that, in that constellation, the car can choose the best fitting solution. The, the boundaries are already set by the EMS, yeah? Because it knows what happens already. And that is the allocation process. So that means the car now can say, hey, I can best do my job on the best way if I use this in the boundaries you gave to me. Yeah? If there's anything in between where the, for example, the, the EMS needs to update this information, then it can start up or ask for a new allocation process based on new uh, boundaries. Yeah? So in that case, for me, if we have these um, yeah, duties clear, then every device can work or can, can run in this constellation uh, as optimal as possible. This is my view on that. And I think you can, can uh, as, um, scale it. Yeah, you can, can uh, start with a, a small, um, um, architecture at home, you can um, extend it, you can uh, um, scale it on a higher level in a, in a, a multi-apartment house and so forth. You can do it however you want. And this is also the constellation we have in, in Nordashet, for example, the, the um, um, uh, customer size of, of uh, Stadtwerk in Nordashet, the DSO and the ESP in, in Nordashet is about 13,000 uh, 13, uh, users. Yeah? They can do it if that makes sense. Yeah? But you need to, to tailor it to the needs and to the constellations you have. This is my view. Yeah? Yes, it's it's in line. It's in line with what I was expecting because uh, it, it, we 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 will have to have consumers defining, uh, let's say, um, moralistic preferences and leave the systems to make that negotiation and to be able to adapt to the condition that defined by the boundaries of the EMS, they can respond in the best way within the household using the resources that are more favorable in a certain moment. Thank you, Josef. So we, oh, I have here one question from, from Hojat. He, um, he wants to understand uh, the definition of the minimum and maximum temperature limits that David presented <laughs> in, in slide 15. How do you determine them? Good question. Um, well, the, 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 the minimum limit has to do uh, with the, the, the main regret we have on taking some of these actions without compromising the comfort. So the minimum temperature that you have there, it's one, one example. So it's, it's not one specific case altogether. It's a case where we have uh, an electric water heater with 120 liters with uh, 1.5 kilowatt, if I'm not mistaken, of power. 
but basically where we have established that it's a household where typically there's two baths done every day. And within that temperature, we wouldn't, the minimum temperature, we wouldn't compromise the, the comfort um, inside the house. So we'll never come to a point where uh, if the user would need to take those two baths and participate in the flexibility service, they would see uh, compromising its comfort. The max value has to do with the, the whole uh, construction process and the actual characteristic of the electric water heater. So uh, it's the the highest or near to highest temperature that the water heater can can sustain. Then we have defined uh, a target temperature, and this target temperature is something that you can configure with the optimization system, where you should put the temperature of your electric water heater. And this is the the fact the temperature that has to do with your ability to provide flexibility on one direction and another. So this is the, the, the rationale for the definition of the temperature. Of course, all of this depends on having information from the technical appliance itself. That's why what Joseph was mentioning about SARF, it's extremely important. That's where we can get this information, technical, this technical information that can be fed in into the energy management systems, because otherwise, we do need to rely on the end user to insert part of this information manually. And the typical approach is to use either an app or a web portal to have the user configure some of this, of this information so the system can know what type of appliance has. Granted, we can use um, typical models for, for uh, typical use cases in different countries and buildings, but it's easier if we have this information up front. This is where actually the part of SARF and by mapping this directly and having a, a, a system that can retrieve this information, whatever it is, if it's local via gateway or remote in a cloud-based system, as Yosef was mentioning, it's irrelevant. Uh, it's, what we need to know is that we have that information to, to fit into the models. Thank you very much, um, David. So um, we are, reaching our time but i still have uh, one question going back to, uh, as i said uh, when you were exploring that concept of uh, the virtual battery um when we when we design medium and, and, and low voltage networks we assume that uh, not every load happens at the same time and so power engineers take this into consideration in in the dimension of the system and we understand the benefits of, of having this, uh, let's say, widespread approach where we consider that people's behavior can actually change and, and we have this, this, this canceling effect in some moments of the day. When you were explaining the, the virtual uh, battery uh, and you did mention the, the, the local optimization, would, would this concept be more interested, interesting if we take it to the to the community level to have, for example, uh, larger resources uh, managed within the different the different stakeholders, local stakeholders? Wouldn't this increase the reliability of this flexibility that we 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 offer to to to, to, to the system? It's also a good question. Uh, there's two fronts to, to that, that question. Um, first of all, is the fact that we are creating, well, let's let's step a bit back. Uh, with the bottom-up approach, we're providing a different way of communicating the flexibility and having someone else trying to valorize that flexibility. And that's relevant for all of the participants, including the, the communities. And in the sense that in a community, when the community is starting, it doesn't have a, exactly a plan and it's trying to understand what's the availability of different resources, we need to start somewhere. Someone needs to trigger the process and try to, to validate or estimate the potential flexibility that exists in the households. And this could be further refined as the, the, the operation moves on. And this is where both in the communities as in the regular use of a retailer that we may have or an aggregator what would be the retailer 5.0 or 6.0, um, we could have data in between. So we're departing from uh, the modeling side where we make some assumptions, but as we, we go into the operation, we start retrieving data. And this is where we get data, uh, as you were mentioning, was about simultaneity, as we know how to cope with this variability. What we do have with this is a starting point and the ability within the battery to easily um, make this these stakeholders. I want to use the flexibility to understand where they should put or where they should, or 
where they should incentivize the participants to have their internal or the representation of the, the, the virtual batteries at the specific operation point. And this has to do with the strategy if you want someone else to, to participate, because this also relates with something that we have been addressing also from the power system side, which is the fairness to access to some of these services integration if you're at the beginning or at the end of the feeder. Uh, if voltage varies, you're prone to have a beneficial situation on one side and a very pessimistic side on another side, load or generation wise. But typically, if we have someone else that wants to, to compensate this within the feeder, then you can have these batteries along the feeder with different state of charges, because basically you're expecting and you have data that, that you can already use on what you're doing into the market and the expectation that you have to remunerate yourself and your stakeholders, your, your, your customers, your pool of representatives towards a specific behavior. For instance, while you have solar, to have uh, increasing load there because you want to promote uh, self-consumption. At the end of the day, you want to, to, to remove or try to alleviate the peak load. So load a little bit of, of uh, peak shaving at that time. So it has to do with the strategy. One thing is for sure, if we start this way, we have one point of starting that it's more realistic than if we start by just disseminating information top down, which was done the usual way. And that's only done because as you said, it's a large system already operating where we have a lot of information about the condition and we typically know where we need that flexibility to be. In, the, in smaller systems, in more local systems, that's not exactly the case, nor is the, the, the amount of information that, uh, that high to allow us to, to have already that idea. Okay. Thank you very much, um, David. I'm quite happy because we have two things. I have to congratulate both of you because we didn't lose any people when you were making your presentations. That means it, they were interesting. And so people were, were actually um, enjoying uh, listening to you. I also enjoyed listening to you. I think this was a very good contribution in an area that is of the utmost relevance uh, in this process that we have for the energy system of the future. So I think we are in condition to, to, to close um, this session. Um, I would invite everyone that is attending that if by any reason you have any further questions, you can address them directly to, to David. David can pass them to Joseph or to me. We are available to, to support you on this. Um, and, and, and to really appreciate, thank everyone for, for, for your presence. And once again, to, to, to David and, and Joseph for this very interesting uh, discussion. Okay. Thank you very much. And we are on schedule, which is something that is not very typical when I'm running these sessions. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.